Hello and welcome. I am Scrapperlock and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server. We are level 40 with Quintessence Lass who has over 9 million XP, 800,000 to go to get to the next level. If you do the math on that, we're going to have just about 10 million XP when we hit level 1 and get our first epic pool power, which I still haven't decided what it's going to be. We have almost 33 million influence <clears throat> and we've gotten onto a story arc for Indigo, which is about the Malta group. And we're looking for a guy named Melvin Langley who was kidnapped. So she says she doesn't have any new leads on where Melvin Langley could be, but I did find out that he interviewed a man named Jim Bartlett. Right before he was abducted, I, as I understand it, Jim Bartlett used to be a hero back in the 40s, codenamed Thunderhead, so we're going to have to go and rescue Thunderhead. Which we have done on our other characters before. Now, um, one of the things I've done, uh, as working for Indigo, I've had to fight the Knives of Artemis a couple times. I've set this back down to times one rather than times two. It's not that we can't do the Knives, but they're incredibly frustrating to fight when there are too many of them because they can throw many, many, many caltrops down and then your character can't move, you can't jump, you can't get out of the, the middle of a fight if you want to move out of the caltrops. They do damage over time. They only do a little bit, but when you have four or five of them laid down on top of you at once... They're doing all this damage and you can't move. And it's just frustrating, right? I'm not like necessarily losing the battles. It's just a pain in the neck. And then after the fight's over, you've got a whole bunch of caltrops and you're just moving very slowly, very slowly through the caltrops trying to get out of them, which I just find incredibly frustrating. So I dropped it down to times one. When we fight the Malta, which I fought a couple times, is there no problem on times two? Um, I've been able to deal with the sappers using Touch of Fear the one time it actually seems to work. Um, you queue it up, you run in, you hit them with it before they react to you. They might get a shot off, but by the time they do, they're be they've hit been hit a couple times and they're super debuffed. So they mostly miss me. I think I've been hit once by a sapper. They're actually no problem at times too. At least they weren't in the one mission I did against them, but a lot of these missions have been against the Knives of Artemis. And again, although they're beatable at times too, they're not any fun to fight because of the way the caltrops work. Um, so this is your typical City of Heroes design. Um, some of the, what they did with the villains is to make them increasingly annoying rather than actually hard, and that's kind of what the knives are like. So um, I'm not down for the annoyance part, even though I am down for the difficulty part. So we're just going to be fighting at times one until we get out of the Malta because the knives come along with the Malta a lot of the times. Now this is Malta so this won't be hard. Um, this will probably be too easy. Um, but if it was uh, it was knives it's just super annoying and um, I just prefer not to not to deal with that many of them. Uh, you know because all of them throw caltrops and so it's just sort of frustrating. As we go, um, one of the things I'd like to do is uh, get into one of our theoretical role-playing game discussions, especially since this is times one. It, it won't be requiring the massive amount of attention that, say, a times three mission might need of me, so we can talk about some other things. Um, and we need to save Jim Bartlett. So we have to find him, and we're going to want to clean everything out on the way in because we're going to have to escort him out, as I recall, and deal with ambushes. Now this will be should be okay with this character because we do have <clears throat> um, taunt, and so we can taunt the enemies to us. But we have to watch out with Thunderhead because he like if I remember right he likes to aggro things, and the enemies like to shoot AOEs and stuff at us, so we have to watch out. He might get killed anyway. We'll do the best we can to save him. So role playing games um, and role playing game theory. One of the things I would like to talk about today was. Inspired by a... I watched a podcast, and they were talking about whether Dungeons & Dragons is a storytelling game. <clears throat> I don't want to get into that, because I don't really want to talk about D&D so much. What I really want to talk about is not whether it's a, role, a storytelling game, but what makes something a role-playing game. This is relevant for us, right? Because City of Heroes is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Or is it... <clears throat> When it first came out, when it was getting ready to come out, there was a, a, a commercial for it, like a trailer. And in the trailer, <clears throat> it, it had like words coming up as it was showing you animations that never did appear in the game, but were just designed to be PR. 
Not that the animations are bad, but these were like movie quality motion capture type in animations, which they definitely don't have in this game. And words were coming up as they were showing you this, and the words said um, mul massively multiplayer online superheroes. Didn't say role playing. <clears throat> And often the developers had referred to it as an MMO, Massively Multiplayer Online, but not an RPG. A couple times they referred to it as an MMOG. And so several of the people in the pre-beta forums, the old forums that were like black background with white text, <clears throat> before they switched to the blue and white that they used during live, questioned this and said, are you telling us it's not a role-playing game? And they said, no, 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 we're not saying that. But they kind of were saying that. And so then, you know, you could just debate, well, what makes it a role-playing game? Is this an RPG? I think, <clears throat> at first glance, most people would probably say, yes, it's an RPG. Right? You've got a character, it's gaining levels, it's gaining abilities as it levels up. And that makes it an RPG. But I would actually argue that that's not what makes something an RPG. And there are lots of games that are clearly not RPGs where you can level up. You can level up in Train Simulator. You can level up in Euro Truck, and those are not role-playing games, but you can still level up your quote-unquote avatar and gain abilities. Right? <clears throat> so what makes something a role-playing game? I think there are three things. Of these, City of Heroes has at most one. And it's why I would say that technically, City of Heroes is not actually a role-playing game doesn't mean I don't like it, and I treat it like a role-playing game, but I don't think it technically is. So what do you need to have something be a role-playing game? And I've derived this from a discussion I heard in a different podcast by the, the guy who created the um, Blackmore, what it's called, Secrets of Blackmore, I think, um, movie. And I m didn't hit this guy fast enough to kill the auto to prevent the auto turret from coming out, but that's all right. <clears throat> and um, I haven't seen the movie. This is a kind of a movie about how Dave Arneson created the game Blackmore, which is what D and D is actually based on, and um, the origins of D and D. And he was asked what makes something a role playing game, and he gave an answer similar to this, but I've kind of reworded it my own way, and I put my own sort of spin on it. So here's what I think you need to have. There are three things that you have to have in order to have a role-playing game. And the one that City of Heroes has is the first one. In order for something to be a role-playing game, it has to be the case that the players of the game are interacting with the environment through the abilities of their characters. That is, you see, hear, feel the world through the senses of your character. You interact with the world through the abilities of your character. And so you can only see, as a player, you're only told what your character sees. And when your character does something, it does it with its abilities and not yours. So a great example would be this character has a defense of 32. That means that 32% of the time, straight off the top, when this guy shoots at her, he misses her because she has dodging ability. Or, in this case, she has an aura around her that causes the bullets to bend and, and warps reality and causes the bullets to sort of miss her, right? I don't have to double tap left, double tap right to dodge out of the way. I don't have to jump over the bullets. If I were doing that, I'd be using my reflexes to dodge the attacks. But if I'm <clears throat> not doing any of that, if I can turn on this toggle and it changes the two-hit probability then I'm interacting with this world using the abilities of the character. And that is absolutely what City of Heroes does. And this is why, by the way, when some of the more action-oriented quote-unquote role-playing games come out, I'll say, well, it's not really a role-playing game. If I have to use my manual dexterity to avoid a bullet, then this isn't the character's abilities, it's mine, then I'm not interacting with the world using my character's abilities, I'm interacting with the world using my abilities, and therefore, it's not really a role-playing game. Um, <clears throat> so, now in a lot of games like this, you simply can't do what the character is supposed to be doing, right? So, for instance, 
like I don't have superpowers. I can't blast energy through the screen. So that's interacting with the world using your character's abilities. Um, so that's one thing, and many computer games do have that, that you can interact with the world through your character's abilities and not yours. And here is um, Thunderbolt, or Thunderhead. I'm going to ignore this second guy and go after these guys, because um, as soon as we defeat the second guy, he is going to become attackable. And I don't want him attackable until I've defeated everybody else in case they shoot AoEs at me. So I think the first thing you need for a role-playing game is that you're interacting with the world through the abilities of your character. And um, so, for example, when I was a kid, I thought Dungeons & Dragons might be cooler if, like, we took my plastic bow and arrow with the suction cup arrows and we shot at a target. I'm, I'm still going to leave this guy out here and just clean up. Um, and if you hit the target, your character, with your elf with the bow and arrow, hits the target. But hey, that's cool. Well, that's not role-playing. Because it doesn't matter whether I'm good at shooting a target. In a role-playing game, what matters is, does my character have ability to shoot the target? <clears throat> and so, no, you shouldn't be, like, trying to punch someone to see if your character could hit. You shouldn't be trying to shoot a target with an actual physical bow and arrow to see if your character would shoot it, shoot at his enemy successfully with a bow and arrow. Oh, we didn't have to lead him out? Okay. Um, to have a... Well, there's a boss. Let's take him. To have a role-playing game, <clears throat> your character is the one who's doing things. And therefore, you're experiencing the world through the abilities of your character. And that's one thing you have to have to have a role-playing game. Many role-playing games, many computer games that say they're role-playing games do have that. The second thing you need to have a role-playing game is that um, hang on here let me just make sure we've got this guy here. I think we're fine the second thing you need is that your character has to be you have to be able to as a player have the character do things that change the environment and make it so that after you did the thing the environment is different from how it was before <clears throat> We've sort of done that here in this mission. Why am I not able to jump? Oh, I've been hit with a web grenade. Uh, we've sort of been able to do that in this mission. We've cleaned this sewer out. There are no Malta in here. Um, there isn't a kidnap victim in here. The environment has changed. But the second I hit mission complete and we leave, this instant disappears. And the next time somebody goes into that instance to do that mission, it's exactly the same as it was when I went in there. There are Malta and there's a prisoner. And every time somebody does this story arc for Indigo, they're going to have to rescue um, Thunderbolt, which means you can't actually change the world in City of Heroes. If um, a bunch of players went into Boomtown with their characters and wiped all of the bad guys out of Boomtown to clean it up, and you come back tomorrow, everything's respawned, and Boomtown isn't any different from how it was yesterday or the day before. Um, so you have to be able to change the environment in some way in order for it to be a role-playing game. An example of how you could change the environment in my campaign, my players cleaned out a goblin mine and rescued kidnap victims and brought them back and found out that the mayor of the town, not, not really a mayor, but the leader of the town, was betraying the, the Roman Empire and got him deposed, and a new mayor was put in place. And so they've completely changed that town. It has a new leader now. It's, they've rescued kidnap victims. They destroyed, they killed the orcs in a tower, and the Roman Empire now has possession of that tower, which means that they're protecting a roadway that wasn't being protected before. So the, the environment has changed. You cannot do that in City of Heroes because the environment is the same every time you log in. Every time you start a new character, you go through Outbreak, or you were rescue Michael Habishi's wife, or what have you. And so... Um, so you have to be able to change the environment to have a role-playing game, and it's something you really can't do in City of Heroes. Let's talk to Indigo, and we'll talk about the third thing you need to have a role-playing game.
<clears throat> she says, I'm glad you're able to save Mr. Bartlett, Quintessence Lass. These people are ruthless. You have to understand that Jim Bartlett was a hero and a good person, and they were more willing to kill him because they thought he might know some more than willing to kill him because they thought he might know something. Why would you kill somebody if you think he knows something? Just the fact that he talked to Melvin Langley was enough to put his life in danger. He says our friend she says our friends are doing a little cleanup work in Melvin Langley's office. Office, I want you to get over there and stop them from wiping it out. <clears throat> so this is either going to be more Malta or the knives of Artemis. So I think for role playing games, you're interacting with the through, with the environment through the medium of your character, and it's your character's abilities that matter, not yours. And when you use those abilities to interact with the environment, you can change it, and you change it in ways that then can affect you later. <clears throat> if you depose the king, the new king might be more friendly to you and that will affect you later, or might be less friendly to you, and that will affect you later. So those are two things. And then the third thing that you need to have a role-playing game is that the players have to be able to do things that are not explicitly described in the rules. It doesn't say you can do them. It doesn't say you can't. And basically, the, working together, the GM and the players decide what can and can't be done. <clears throat> so a great example of this would be my um, jaunt that my party did to the Astral Sea. I made up a whole bunch of mechanisms and stuff that are not in the rules that are about how the Astral Sea works. And some things the players asked me if they could do, I hadn't made up myself ahead of time. I hadn't thought about it. And I had to decide what was going to happen. So for example... I mentioned in one of the earlier playthroughs that the, um, <clears throat> there's a boss, okay, that the uh, players tried to persuade a dragon to join them to fight a pirate, right? It doesn't say in the rules whether the players can persuade a dragon to fight a pirate or not. I had to decide whether the persuasion was going to work. I had to decide how hard it was to persuade them, what skill check to make, <clears throat> what can, what the conditions of the skill check were, whether there were any penalties. None of these are actually specifically listed in the rule book. <clears throat> so that's something where I, as the game master, and the players, as players, had to sort of come to a negotiation about how this is going to work and how we're going to resolve it. Right? And so, yes, persuasion checks are in the rules, but it doesn't explicitly say in the rules that the GM uh, has to allow the players to be able to persuade a dragon to fight a pirate for them. It also doesn't say in the rules what's going to happen if the players are successful. Is the dragon going to betray them? Is the dragon going to fight the pirate to the death? Is the dragon going to distract the pirate's minions so the players can fight the pirate one-on-one -on -one and don't have to worry about all of the other pirates, right? <clears throat> that None of that's in the rules anywhere. That's something that I, as the game master and the players as players, have to figure out as part of the process of playing the game. And this is something that role-playing games generally can't have if they're on the computer. It's literally impossible for you to have your character ever do anything that isn't specified in the code because if it wasn't programmed by the programmers you can't you literally cannot do it right you, you simply like I can't walk through this wall it wasn't programmed if I wanted to attack Melvin Langley when we find him I can't he's not targetable right <clears throat> if I want to join the Malta or offer to join them for a price I can't because it's not programmed Right? Whereas in Dungeons & Dragons, you can do it. You're playing a D&D module, and it's expecting the players to fight the goblins, and the players say, hey, let's negotiate with the goblins and join them. Rather than helping the, helping the town, we're going to help the goblins. Well, the GM can figure that out and run it. doesn't say you can do it in the book, but the GM can allow it. 
So I think a really important part of role-playing games is that you can do things that aren't explicitly accounted for in the rules. I'm not necessarily talking about homebrew. <clears throat> you can make up your own rules in any game. We did in Monopoly, free parking. We would put a $500 bill. A lot of people do this in the middle of the board. And any taxes and stuff that were paid through the community chest, draws, or chance cards were put into the middle of the board as part of a pot. And whoever landed on free parking would get the pot, and then we, the bank would ante up another 500 bucks, and we would just keep doing that. Right? That's a house rule. It's not stated in the rules that you can do it. It's a house rule. But that's really not what I mean. What I mean is something more like I land on um, Park Place, and you've got a hotel on it, and you say, okay, you have to pay me rent. And I say, well, can I burn your house down instead? Can I put it on my credit card? Y you kind of can't do that, right? Because the game doesn't have any way to allow you to do it. Whereas in a role-playing game, we do stuff like that all the time. Can I try this instead? Well, okay, let me think about it. If you watch the show Critical Role, which I did in the past, although I haven't in a while, um, there are many times when the players will ask to do something and the GM, Matt Mercer, will think about it and he'll say, okay, I'll allow it. When he says, I'll allow it, what is he saying? He's saying, well, there isn't anything in the rules that actually addresses whether you can or you can't do this particular thing. So I will, as a game master, since the rules don't say whether you can do it or not, I will decide whether you can. And so he's allowing them to do something that isn't explicitly stated in the rules. It's usually something the rules don't say you can't do it, and they don't say you can do it. They don't talk about it at all, and it's left up to the game master and the players. And so <clears throat> that is something... Wow, there's a guy here. There's almost never a guy over here. Oh, this has got to be one of the first times... Oh, 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 not good. Getting hit by a sapper here. Let's get, kill the sapper. And let's get some endurance back. Fortunately, we can do that with this character. Let's give him some fear. So one thing fear does is it does debuff them. Oh, this has got to be the first time I've ever seen a hostage here in all the time I've played City of Heroes. I was just coming back here to complete the map. <clears throat> So in any case, I think that these are the three things you need to have a role-playing game, and you need all three. One is you interact with the world through the abilities of your character. Two is you can change the world in ways that are permanent or at least long-lasting with your character. And three is that you can do things or, or ask to have your character do things that aren't explicitly mentioned in the rules. And if you can do all three of those, and only if you can do all three of those, you have a role-playing game. So, is City of Heroes a role-playing game? Well, I would say no, because it only does one. It does allow you to interact with the world through the abilities of your characters. And you pretty much reflexes don't matter. You got to click on things, but because there are cues to the action, um, you don't have to be super precise about it. And one of the reasons I'm good at City of Heroes, because I don't have really great reflexes, as I'm sure anybody who's watched this show for any length of time can see, is that I don't have to be hair trigger really awesome with the reflexes. And my character, you know, she can handle it on her own, kind of, because she has these abilities and the game is basing its interactions with her based on her stats and these numbers up here and the other numbers you don't see and not my own personal abilities and so it does have that but there's no way to change the world in any meaningful way and it's just these missions are the same every time you run them maybe it's a different map but it's the same goal the same guys you're rescuing same thing, and you're going to have the same mission with every character. Everybody's doing, you know, every one of my characters on the hero side has done the Wheel of Destruction. Every single one of them has done the Scroll of Tialeku. 
doing it doesn't change anything. Right? Just got to watch out for this sapper here. Um, and then finally, you can't do things that aren't accounted for in the rules in any computer game. So, City of Heroes is a great game. But I would argue, by my definition, it's not actually a role-playing game. Now, do I use it as one? Sure. I, you join a role-play guild, and um, yes, then actually we could choose to do things in our minds, you know, like headcanon, that aren't accounted for by the rules. For example, my guild, when bases didn't exist yet, we would meet on a, a rooftop, the rooftop near the train station in Talos Island, and that was quote-unquote our base. And we role-played in chat and claimed that our characters were in a super base, right? Which wasn't being accounted for by the rules. And we stood around and in chat had our characters do things that the rules didn't allow, right? And so we couldn't actually do them using the game mechanics, but we could do them just by typing, right? So like, let's say my character punches yours. Well, it actually, you couldn't do it because they don't allow um, PvP or didn't allow PvP at the time. But <clears throat> we would emote it, right? And that sort of enabled us to pretend that we were having our characters do things that it didn't say in the rules, right? And we could pretend that there were permanent changes happening to the world in the parts that we were role-playing about, right? Like my um, one friend made up this story about how his character was working for Cray and we were in this one mission and he was he was just narrating we have to like we went to the there were these containers over here and he said these are the containers of whatever the crate were doing we have to destroy them and so we all we all fired off our AOEs to pretend that we had destroyed these containers right so we were making it up and using the game like a role playing game but if you just play city of heroes as it's been programmed it's not a role playing game right and this isn't a knock this is not a knock on City of Heroes. I've been playing all these episodes of it. I love doing it. We're going to play this character to level 50. And um, I'm having a blast. But as it's programmed, playing the game, you know, sort of as it's designed, it's not a true role playing game. It doesn't make it bad, but it's really not designed as a true role playing game. And I would argue most computer games haven't been and kind of can't be because most of the time they can't let you allow you to completely change the environment and they can't as a computer program it cannot allow you to do things that weren't designed by the designers because you can only do what the code allows you to do right so I can't negotiate with the Malta here and try to negotiate their surrender because they didn't program that and so it's not possible. Now you could do it with headcanon and say, well, when it looks like my character is beating people up, she's actually negotiating with them. But that's not what the game is doing. That's you making stuff up. Right? So you can turn almost anything into a role-playing game if you want by ignoring the rules and doing your own thing. But an actual role-playing game is a game that doesn't just... It, that that it, a game, an actual role playing game, isn't a game where you can ignore the rules. You could do that in chess if you wanted, right? It's a game that is designed to allow you to do things. It wants you to do things that are not explicitly accounted for in the rules, right? The, in other words, the rule book of say something like Savage Worlds or D and D, the rule books are there to help you figure out how to do all the things that aren't in the rules so that you can play a full role-playing game and not just what it says in the rules, right? And so they, they, don't, they tell you, here's how to make a skill check, but they also tell you, here, here are how to, here's how to do the things that we don't tell you how to do, right? How, the DM has to like learn how to make rulings, and they teach the DM or the GM how to make the rulings rather than all the different rules, right? And so it's, it's, it's actually a very sort of strange way 
to write a rule book because they're pages they're huge thick you know hundreds of pages long and mostly what they're doing is yeah they're giving you rules but they're also saying yeah but you know these rules are going to interact with each other in ways that we can't anticipate and the gm has to be capable of figuring out what will happen when this occurs right role playing games are inherently complex systems and complex systems classically defy our ability to completely quantify and specify them and so um you know yes they have these long descriptions of spells in the player's handbook for dungeons and dragons but they can't tell you how this spell is going to work against every single monster and every once in a while you'll come up with a monster's abilities and you're like well wait a minute how is that spell going to dovetail with this monster's abilities is that actually going to work against this monster it doesn't say whether it does or not so the gm has to rule whether it does or not somebody for instance made a great question <clears throat> Now the D and D Beyond forums and said, in terms of wish, right, which is a spell that allows you to make a wish and whatever you wish for happens. What 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 happens if let's say a god has chosen to to like do something with its god powers, and then a player makes a wish against what the god did? I hear a glowy over here. Where is it? Here it is. Will the wish will a wish be able to undo the power of a god? And the answer was, uh, that's up to you as a DM. <clears throat> the rules aren't going to tell you, yes, they will or no, they won't. Instead, they leave it up to the GM. The GM decides whether your wish can undo the act of a god. Right? And what a lot of us said was, well, it probably can, but you're going to anger the god. <clears throat> and the god might take revenge on you or just redo whatever they did. And so, like, that really depends on how the gods are specified in your world, which is not something the rules can tell you. And it depends on how the game master wants to run it, which is not something the rules can really tell you. And so um, a lot is left open to the game master and the players. <clears throat> and what they do is they give you enough rules that you can play the game your own way. And they tell you how to do that. And that isn't really something that computers can do. Right? All the computer can do is what it was programmed to do. And so it's really, I would argue mostly tabletop games that are role-playing games because those are the only way those are the only games games run by a human that can do things that aren't written in the rules it can allow you to do things that are not explicitly accounted for in the rules and not only do they allow it but in a game like champions or dnd or savage worlds or call of cthulhu they encourage you to do things that aren't listed in the rules we can't anticipate everything they'll say, so it's up to the game master to decide how these two things kind of synergize with each other. <clears throat> it's up to the GM to decide what happens when these two apparently conflicting rules come into conflict. What do you do? And the GM decides that in collaboration usually with the players. <clears throat> And that's one of the most fun aspects of a role-playing game is when the players ask to do something that isn't accounted for in the rules and the game master has to decide, okay, how do we do this? And then, you know, you figure it out and, you know, it's usually make a roll about something. Roll your dice and see what you get. And if you succeed, you can do it. And if you fail, you can't. <clears throat> One of the people on D&D Beyond sent me a private message. He's been banned, so he can't post to the forums, and I guess he needs to pick somebody's brain about this. I've done this a couple times, too. <clears throat> I'll usually do it because some of my player, 
players in D&D read the forum, and I don't want spoilers. So um, sometimes I'll just write to an individual GM and say, what would you do about this? And what he wrote me is, he has this paladin who, like, it's a fourth level party, I think, and it's or third level, and it's a seventh level paladin. And he figured, you know, with one paladin that the players would be able to defeat it, and he kind of kicked their butts. And the paladin has been charmed by this banshee, it's like a homebrew banshee, I guess, legendary. And um, he expected the characters to fight the banshee alone, but he said, I think they're going to have to fight the banshee along with the her paladin because he's on her side now. And there's no way they're going to be able to beat both of them, so what do I do? He said, I could have the paladin just turn to their side, but that's kind of lame. So I said... Now, again, this is a game master. Like, there's nothing in the rules about this. He's just trying to figure it out. And so what I said was, well, one thing you could maybe do, and there's another sapper, is do it as a skill challenge, right? And each round as a bonus action, in addition to fighting the zombie and the, or the, the banshee and moving around, they could, as a bonus action, try to persuade the paladin to join their side and if they get enough successes before they fail, he joins them. And if they fail, he sides with the Banshee and they probably lose. Now, there isn't anything in the rules that says you can do that. But he could if he wants to, right? Explain to the players this is going to be a skill challenge. You can intimidate. You can persuade. You can use your history skill to explain to him that he's like defy he's like defying his own history, his own tenets of his you can use religion to explain to him that he's defying the tenets of his own faith and if you make five successful checks before three failed checks you snap him out of it right and so this allows the players to use their abilities the abilities of their characters to do something to help their side of the combat and so um that's doing something that's not explicitly accounted for. There's nothing in the rules that says that you can run a skill challenge in combat to persuade somebody to your side. <clears throat> it absolutely does not say that anywhere in the rules. And I'm fairly sure, even in 4th edition, where sp skill challenges were explained, they don't have anything in the rules of 4th edition that say that you can or can't run a skill challenge in the middle of combat like that. But I've run them in the middle of combat. They work really well in the middle of combat as bonus actions because most players don't have a lot of things they can do with their bonus action other than maybe make their offhanded two-weapon combo attack. And um, I feel like we're missing something here. There should be another elevator. There's a lot more hostages to save. Um, so there's another sapper. Missed him. That's not good. And so, um, yeah, being able to do things like that that aren't in the rules is one of the most fun parts of role-playing games. And it's the one thing you kind of can't do in a computer game. So, for role-playing games, if you really want to have a role-playing game, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, you need to have the ability to uh, change the environment in long-term ways. You need to interact with the environment through the abilities of your character. And you need to be able to do things that aren't explicitly written in the rules. And I'd say not only able to do things that aren't explicitly written in the rules, but the game expects and is designed, is intended for you to do things that aren't explicitly written in the rules. Right? In, in fact, I think, there's another hostage, that one that the D&D designers from Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson on would probably say that the main thing you should be doing in D&D is things that aren't, whoops, things that aren't written down in the rules, right? That's what you should be spending a lot of your time as a player and a DM on, is 
figuring out how to get the, allow the characters to do things that the rules don't explicitly say whether you can or can't do. And so, um, so yeah, you need that for a role-playing game, and very, very, very rare is the computer game that will allow it, right? Because they, you just kind of can't. So we have one more hostage. I must have missed somebody on the lower level, I guess. <clears throat> I didn't miss somebody in this room, did I? So yeah, leave your comments. Um, do you agree with my definition of a role-playing game? Do you feel like role-playing games should be defined in some other way? What do you think? <clears throat> or is it just any game where you play a role as a role-playing game? I probably would have defined it that way years ago. But I think, I think it's not necessarily true. Because... Yeah, we're playing a role with this character, but at least soloing through it, are we actually role-playing? Is this a role-playing game? I mean, I don't know if you could really call it that. <clears throat> so now I'm going to have to take forever to find the one guy I missed. Oh, there's another level. Maybe we missed somebody on the lower level. I'm going to pause it here while we look for the last glowy and the last hostage, and I'll bring you back when we find one or both of them. All right, so we found a glowy. Missed that one. It was right here on the first level. I'll keep looking for the last sausage. Oh, and there she is. And it's with a sapper. And an operations engineer, so we're going to have to fight an auto turret, but that's all right. Let's get some endurance back, because he hit me with his sapping. It's so useful to have that and get our endurance back. And one nice thing about this character is the AOEs get that auto turret while we're fighting its owner. And we've completed the mission. So let's head out. <coughs> and Indigo says... Fast work, Quintessence last. The bombing would have cost the lives of a lot of innocents. Unfortunately, we're not any closer to fighting Melvin Langley. We better stay on his trail. We will do that, but we will do that in another episode. Oh, I do want to point out, um, in terms of enhancements, we now have, starting with Season 5, which I guess this is our first Season 5 episode, we now have um, fully invented everything in our slots. I bought this endurance modification and the three jumps because they just weren't showing up in my inventory. So I decided to go ahead and buy them. Um, I did have the three defenses in my inventory, so I went ahead and crafted those. Those are my last sort of seven. Everything else is fully done. So we will be adding invention enhancements to all of our new slots as we get them and eventually doing sets. And we still have... Five of the six that we need for Touch of the Nictus. We're going to get the last one, hopefully, after we finish this story arc, or maybe Monday, which is a couple of days away. We'll finally get lucky on the decks of cards and get enough reward merits. I think we need 150 for the last one, and right now we have 88, so we're close. <clears throat> it's a couple more story arcs worth, or maybe one or two flips of the cards on Monday, depending on how lucky we get with those decks. Until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been City of Heroes on the Rebirth Server.